Welcome to Wealthy Behavior, talking money and wealth with Heritage Financial, the podcast that digs into the topics, strategies, and behaviors that help busy and successful people build and protect their personal wealth. I'm your host, Sammy Azuz, the president and CEO of Heritage Financial, a Boston-based wealth management firm working with high net worth families across the country for longer than 25 years. Now let's talk about the wealthy behaviors that are key to a rich life. On this episode of the podcast, we have a very special guest, Bob Pisani, Senior Market Correspondent, CNBC, a very familiar face to investors worldwide. Bob's been a CNBC reporter since 1990. He's covered Wall Street and the stock market for 26 years. He now covers the global stock market, IPOs, ETFs, and financial market structure. He's also the author of an excellent book, Shut Up and Keep Talking, Lessons on Life and Investing from the Floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Welcome to Wealthy Behavior, Bob. Thank you, Sammy, and uh, happy to join you. Eager to talk about the book and uh, the markets, anything you want to talk about. Awesome. Great. So one thing that I loved about your book is that it's basically three books in one. One part is the history of the modern market and financial journalism. Another is your career arc professionally and as an investor through, through your journey. And then the third is a lot of investment and life lessons that you learned along the way that you wanted to share with people. Is that a fair summary of of the book? And if so, how did you? Why did you decide to take that path? Yeah, the the it's a tricky business because I did something unusual. I elected to stay put in my job, uh, and I talk about this in the book. Uh, one of the things that everyone has to face is some point in the middle of their career whether or not they want to do something else, and a lot of people do. I came into CNBC in 1990, 33 years ago, and CNBC was a startup. It, I literally joined in the first year. Uh, and it was uh, it, it was tough in the beginning because it, we were still getting our footing, and we really sort of took out took off in 1995 uh, with the Netscape IPO. We didn't know this, but the internet was being born around us, and that's sort of what be- made us famous, uh, investing and the dot com whole era. And I started out as a real estate reporter in 1990, became the stocks correspondent in '97, in the middle of the whole internet thing. Uh, and what happened was in 2000, after dot com and after 9/11, a lot of people left. A lot of people did other went to other places. Um, financial correspondents were still in high demand, and we had them. And I decided to stay put. And as a result of that, 23 years, 25 years covering the stock market. What happens is you become inch wide, mile deep. You become very, very well known for a little part of the world, in my case, called the stock market. And you, I'm now almost 70 years old. It's been a long, long career. And you feel the need when you get to somebody my age <laughs> to sort of summarize what do you think you know about uh, about the world? Specifically, what do you think you know about investing? What do you think works and doesn't work? Um, and a little bit about does any of this mean anything in the real world? Uh, and th- are there any applications for this to life lessons? So there's a piece at the end, my favorite part of the book, Maxims, uh, 58 Maxims on Life and Investing, where I sort of summarize in one sentence, pithy aspects of what being on TV is like, what it means, uh, and, and and sort of how to relate to the rest of the world. So I, I think you did a very fair characterization. It's tricky doing a quasi history, particularly history you're involved in, along with a quasi-memoir. Um, but the publisher was eager to do it. And they said, look, as long as you throw in a lot of celebrity stories <laughs> about celebrities ringing the bell, we're fine. So I threw in a whole bunch of these, you know, what celebrities told me, bringing the bell stories. It's a really excellent book. And I think people will will learn a lot. And I love the maxims at the end. And we'll get to the serious stuff. But one of the ones jumped out at me, and I needed to know more avoid interviewing anyone wearing sunglasses <laughs> yeah this is the maxims in the back i'm i'm italian and i when i look at somebody i look into their eyes obviously um but it's amazing what eyes convey they're they're they not only some people stare right at you uh, and engage you other people kind of look off other people stare down uh, and they don't necessarily do this because they're avoiding you. They're doing it. A lot of people ha- have to think very carefully about what they're saying, either because words don't come naturally to them when they're talking or they want to be careful or they're not sure how to answer the question. There's all sorts of reasons people like stare away from you and try to formulate an answer. But I get very nervous when I can't see their eyes because I sort of use it as a, a, a way of figuring out 
um, what their not just their body language, but you know how they're answering, um, whether they're mad at me, whether they're sincere, all those kind of nonverbal cues. And so one of the things that kind of annoys me is when people show up with sunglasses. Now I have uh, glasses that get darker if you're outside. You know they just change, and and so sometimes this happens naturally, but. I, I tend to want to be able to see people's eyes. So that's, that was the purpose of, of that maxim. Definitely. Fair enough. So you chronicle your search really over the years through the investing universe to find the best investment trading secrets. You, you know, we're almost on the quest for the, for the secret sauce. And you had the opportunity to interact with so many amazing people along the way. And, and eventually you lead the reader to a set of takeaways that you got from five major influences and you know, can you take our listeners through that journey? Because I'm sure they they they're trying to go down the same path. Well, the question is what works and doesn't work long term. And part of the problem is uh, financial literacy is not very high. Uh, and when you write a book like this, you actually have to go back. It's very interesting and think, well, what do I believe? What do I think I know? And I you actually ended up I actually end up with like five pages of notes. Like this is what I think I know. Uh, for example, market timing doesn't work. Uh, generally, avoid trading too much. The list of things. Why? And so then you look at it and say, hmm, okay, so this is what I think I believe. Why do I believe this? And when did I come to believe this? And who taught this to me? I, I wasn't born with this. Right. These, these five pages of things I think I know. And it, you actually have a very interesting process you have to go through where you have to think, well, where did I come up with all of these ideas? And then you go through a worst process, which is, are they all still true? So it turns out what really happened with me was in the 1990s, I met a group of people, some of them were acad academics, that had a profound influence on me. Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, uh, Burton Malkiel, Princeton professor, wrote a, one of the most famous finance books of all time, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Uh, Charlie Ellis, another academic who wrote a very famous book on long-term investing called Winning the Losers Game. Uh, Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Economics Prize uh, for uh, contributions uh, to behavioral economics. He wrote a very famous book in 2000 called Irrational Exuberance, looking at why people do stupid things in investing, irrational things. Uh, and finally, Jeremy Siegel, who's still a friend of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, wrote uh, stocks for the long run in the early 1990s, where he looked at the whole history of stock market investing going back into the 1800s and bond investing and uh, came up with some very important research data indicating, uh, you know, long term stocks tend to outperform bonds. Long term, the stock market goes up about 10 percent a year. Uh, so these people and the books they wrote actually was the basis for what I believe, although if you would have told me that said to me, six years ago, I wouldn't have said it exactly that way. But when you have to write a book that's 400 pages, you kind of get to the basis. So there's four or five things here that was common to all of these people. Uh, number one is the components to investing are return, risk, cost, and time. Return is how much do you think you're going to make? The risk is how much do you, risk do you want to take? So bonds are less risky than stocks. Um, how much is it costing you to do this? If you're, are you paying 1% for your mutual fund? 10 basis points. That makes a huge difference over time. Uh, and then there's the time. How long are you investing for? And this is the key point I say to a lot of young people who say, oh my gosh, I can't stand the volatility in the stock market. And I say, listen, you're 30 years old. You're going to live another 60 or 70 years. What happened last year? The S&P was down 20%. Isn't going to matter to you, even in the next few years. Um, so those four components. So that's one thing. Um, the second is just understanding compounding interests, which is the greatest thing that's ever been invented. There's very small differences in returns make huge differences when compounded over many decades. So the difference between getting a 2% return and a 5% return doesn't sound like much when you have $1,000 investing and it's one year. So you have $1,020 or $1,050 but when compounded over 30, 40, 50 years, those differences are enormous. And you can show that very simply when you so show the law of large numbers, when you get into $100,000 million uh, levels, which is where people get eventually. So that's number two, uh, the, the power of compounding investing. Number three is timing the markets. We The academic evidence is overwhelming. You, you cannot successfully time the markets. To time the markets, you have to be right going into an investment and you have to go be right going out. And the chances that you'll be wrong on one of those 
is very, very high. And you can show this by simply showing people what happens over any time span, 10 years, pick one. And if you're not in on the five best days of those 10 years, it's remarkable how different your returns are. And by the way, if you're in on the five worst days, they're also <laughs> a, a, a lot worse. So you can show that very easy. So don't try to time the markets. Number four, the other than 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 uh, long term and and how long you want to stay in, keep costs low. This was Bogle's key insight in finding founding Vanguard. Own index funds generally. Most people are best off owning index funds or at least low cost actively managed funds because Bogle was able to show fifty years ago that even the few investors who are active managers who outperform the market tend to underperform because the fees that they charge destroys any alpha. So keep costs low. And finally, um, if you really look at risk adjusted returns, investment styles tend to produce pretty consistent uh, average returns uh, in, in the long run. So I, I would say stick with those points here. Um, understanding what the components are to investing, uh, understanding compounding interest and and don't try to time the market and keep costs low by generally owning index funds. Yeah, awesome stuff. And thank you for taking us through that. I, I mean, you shared a, a story in your book that I had never heard before, uh, I think related to market timing, really, and the perils of attempting it. It was an outfit that had hacked their way into getting access to information early, uh -huh. and they still weren't able to outperform uh, or perform to the extent you would think they should, even with that informational advantage. Yes. Uh, so this was a group that hacked into the SEC database. So the SEC has a database where companies report their earnings. And uh, this is where they officially report, not the press releases that you typically see. And it becomes the official record. Well, the companies can put the data in uh, a day or two before just to make sure it's there so that it's released exactly on time. So what happened was this this band of thieves managed to hack the SEC database, the great embarrassment of the SEC. And for a while, they actually had access to the advanced reports. Now, you would think this is the greatest gold mine of all time. If two days before Apple reports, I have Apple's press release in my hands. My God, if you don't think you can make money on that, how could you? It's like seeing the future. And they did a study of these guys, and they actually had these guys' investment record after they had hacked into the system. So they took the biggest bets that they had made and they looked at it and the guys didn't outperform to any <laughs> to any noticeable set. You think, how is this possible? They had the keys to the kingdom. And it, it turns out that the market has very different reactions to earnings than you think. And what, what the problem was, they saw, oh, Apple's gonna make this thing. Therefore, we believe that the stock will move the following amount. And that's where they got wrong. They had the information right, but they had the market reaction completely wrong. They didn't They didn't get it right. So you see what I'm saying here? Like, even when you have the information, you think this is a gold mine, it's hard to get the market reaction right. So there's a good example. And I, I yeah, it's an amazing story. And I, I had not heard that before. The great financial crisis, I think, turned you into a behavioral finance proponent, not, not putting words in your mouth, but I feel like I got that out of the book, presumably because you saw a lot of investment mistakes being made during a very stressful time in the markets and you saw them firsthand. Do you feel like how one reacts to market moves is is one of the most important financial decisions they'll make or series of financial decisions they'll make? Yes. The, the, my favorite part of the book and the thing I have been obsessed with for 20 years is why is everybody so wrong about the future? I mean, think about this. There is an entire industry on Wall Street, entire industry everywhere to predict the future, including weather, weather forecasting. And yet the success record is terrible. And let's just stay with finance. Amateur stock pickers are terrible at picking stocks, but professional stock pickers are terrible at, at picking stocks. Wall Street analysts and strategists are not good predictors of macro trends or individual stock trends. The Federal Reserve, you'd think, the finest economists in the world, and they do, have the finest. You'd think they'd be able to predict the US economy one year in advance. They have a terrible track record. They were so far off on inflation in the last two years, it was comical how bad 
their forecast was. How is this possible? Is everybody startlingly stupid? It turns out it's sort of the other way around. Everybody is extremely intelligent, well-meaning, but there's things that prevent people from getting forecasts right. There's two big things, and there's a couple of chapters in the book about this. It was my primary obsession. The first is uh, predictions are riddled with biases that infect people's opinions and throws their ability to make predictions off. So for example, people have overconfidence in their ability to make decisions. Uh, people have herd instincts. They tend to follow each other in groups. People have recency bias. They think that what happened in the last six months is, is typical and they don't go back and look far enough uh, into the past. So number one, biases. And when you, the cumulative effect of these biases throws the predictions off. And number two is the future is fundamentally unknowable or difficult because there are so many variables. So let's just pick a, pick somebody simple. You're a Caterpillar analyst. Your job is to predict where's that Caterpillar's price going to be one year from now. You think, how hard can that be? So you look at the at Caterpillar's priced off of earnings growth, dividend growth, and some macro predictions around construction, for example. You'd think that's an easy task. It turns out it's almost impossible because there's actually millions of variables that can go into this. So think about this. There's a macro variable where the global economy, the U.S. economy or machinery economy, there is interest rates that go into how much people can borrow to get these machines that, that Caterpillar makes. Then there's management. You could have a management change. The CEO could fall ill. You could have a buyout. They could make fundamental management mistakes uh, by misallocating capital. There, uh, Literally, I could do thousands of different variables that go into making up Caterpillar stock that is part of the whole efficient market idea, and yet you can't predict it. You literally cannot predict it. Forget about things like COVID or the Russian invasion. Where was that on anybody's uh, 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 radar to affect Caterpillar? Yet it did, and nobody predicted it because it was one of those events Maybe uh, COVID wasn't a black swan. Uh, people have been warning about pandemics, but it was certainly not uh, uh, not predictable on anybody's level. So you put this bias that everybody has, different ones, together with the unknowability of the future. It turns out it's really hard to predict the future. And when you realize that, you get a lot more humble about sitting around paying a lot of attention to everybody's opinions. This does not mean that we should stand up, like I go on TV and say, ladies and gentlemen, Everybody's a bunch of idiots. Nobody knows nothing. Back to you, Sue. You can't do that. We are, we're all people who are trying to figure out, earnestly figure out the future. So it's not that forecasting is useless. It's just you have to understand how hard it is. And I've gotten a lot more humble in the last 20 years about all these predictions. By the way, there are ways to do a little bit uh, 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 better on it. There are people who are uh, trying to improve forecasting in, in, in general. I would look up a website, look up the Good Judgment Project uh, run by a University of, of Pennsylvania professor um, who I've been following uh, and they've been trying to figure out how to reduce biases, for example, in forecasting. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I, I'm still cracking up of the back to you, Sue, uh, line on uh, nobody knows anything. So, um, you, you know, getting to the forecasters and the Fed and they're they're part of the, the you know the group that can't do it. Um, how do you feel like the Fed responds to things that they didn't predict? I feel like they're stronger in their correction modes and and maybe weaker in their diagnostic mode. They're getting better at admitting that they're terrible. I mean, Jay Powell has 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 said that they they get forecasts wrong. Um, so and I laud the man because if you look at the difference between what 20 years ago and the Federal Reserve under the prior, uh, under Ben, uh, and certainly under Alan Greenspan, <laughs> it's a completely different organization. We used to sit there in the late 90s. It, listening to Alan Greenspan was like, you know, listening to somebody speak ancient Greek. You, <laughs> you had to like interpret it. And then you had to, then there was differences in the interpretation. And, and he knew this and he did it deliberately because he didn't want to be too pinned down. Jay Powell is much more plain smoking than even Ben uh, and and uh, and Bernanke, uh, and certainly more than Alan Greenspan. So the Fed's gotten better. I I like uh, the fact that they do press releases, even though you know the slightest slip can move the markets. It is a little crazy how much we pay attention to literally commas in the way he talks, um, but it's a lot better than it was twenty years ago. And I, I think the Fed's a lot more 
humble. And I, I just hope that it remains, you know, completely independent because it needs to be. The Federal Reserve was founded specifically to manage bank crisis and to provide liquidity to banks in crises. That's why it was founded. You don't want anybody coming in and trying to micro micromanage them. So I'm generally a, a big supporter of the Fed, even though everybody knows their forecasts aren't very good. So in the book, you you touch on a couple of times this notion that everyone talks their book. Be cognizant of the motives of the people you're talking to. Could could you elaborate on that and perhaps help individual investors understand, you know, uh, that warning? And also, what's the best way to interact with your network? And are there segments and guests that they should be paying more or less attention to as they're trying to navigate the this investment universe? Well, I say everybody talks their book because it's so obvious. It's like the air breathing the air. I mean. <laughs> One of the things a journalist has to, Ernest Hemingway, who had a big influence on me growing up, I know this is like uh, old school, but used to say that every reporter needs to have a built-in foolproof crap detector. Uh, And there's a lot of crap in the world. Um, There's a lot of people trying to sell you things. And this is true on Wall Street. We get strategists and analysts on, what are they trying to sell you? Well, you know, XYZ strategists at, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley says the stock market uh, is going to be weaker three months from now. He's trying to sell you a story that makes him look good. uh, And he's got a point of view. Some people are literally got money invested in stocks and are trying to convince you to go that way, like hedge fund people uh, who come on talking their book. They already have a position. They think bonds are going to go down, yields are going to go up, and they're going to come on TV trying to tell you why you think you should think bonds are going down and yields are going up. Duh. We know this. We know they're talking their book. So there's nothing here that we're trying to figure out. Gee, what are they trying to do with us? We know these guys' positions. So when you know that, you can't, you, you you sort of drop the idea, oh, somebody's trying to con us here. There's nobody conning us. You just have to be aware of what's going on. Everybody's trying to convince you of their position somehow. No, but that doesn't mean that nobody has any value. I think there's tremendous value. There are people I disagree with, people I think have been wrong for a long time. I know they've been wrong. There are people who've been right. And so what I do is I I tend to put all of this through the filter of my own experience. This is what I mean when I say one of the few things about staying in one spot for a long time is you get very good at built-in foolproof crap detectors. This is why ultimately I became a a Jack Bogle disciple. And I have a whole chapter in the book describing what I own. I am one of the very few people that have ever actually said, here's what I did. Here's the stupid mistakes I made in the last 30 years in investing. And here's what I own right now. And I tell people, I literally tell the set, the stocks, not the stocks, I own mutual funds and ETFs uh, and why I own them. Uh, And it should be no surprise to you that my biggest single holding is the S&P 500. That's a core holding for anybody. And I would find it hard to believe that anyone would argue with me on that idea. So don't put too much into the idea that everybody's trying to sell everything to you. Uh, I would be more concerned with understanding your own state of mind, your your own behavioral economics. And that is, how old are you? How long do you think you're going to live? You're going to live longer than you think. <laughs> Trust me, you are. So I'll give you, let me be concrete with you. I'm almost 70 years old. For years, I used to think I was going to die at 85. And having hung out now with actuarials and see medical advancements in the last 10 years, they've all been telling me I'm wrong that I should work to 90 to 95. And I now think they're right. I I think the chances of me living to 90 are extremely high now. Uh, and so I change. Uh, and you're going to live longer than you think, too. And this is particularly true of people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who like freaked out last year when the market was down 20%. So understand how long you're going to live. Understand your risk tolerance. So if you're 70% in stocks, Uh, in your retirement fund, and you're down 20% last year, don't freak out. Or if you are literally not sleeping at night, maybe you ought to bring it down to 50%. But understand long-term how the market acts. And uh, uh, before we go, I just want to get a couple minutes on on how the market behaves long-term. But the, the third thing is when you keep, when you're in index funds long-term, it takes a lot of decision-making away from you. And that's what's beautiful about it. The market tends to go up over time. Three out of four years, the S&P 500 in the last 100 years has been up. Three out of four years. 60% of the time, the S&P goes up 10% a 
or more a year. Now, think about that. Now, that didn't happen last year, right? The S&P had a 20% decline last year. Do you know how rare that is? That's like 12%, 10% of the time that ever happens. Most of the time, the S&P goes, goes up, three out of four times. It's down 0 to 10%, about 15% of the time, and 10% or more, about 12% of the time. So the market tends to rise over time. Uh, and and declines don't last long. So last year was down 20%. You, you know, the, the, there's only been, I think, eight or nine times in since the 1920s where we've been down 20 to 30%. And two thirds of the time, you were whole within a year. You went back to where you were. There's only a few times it was down more. There's, uh, I think, five times it was down 30 to 50%. And two times it was down 50 to 84 And Again, all of them eventually came back. The 1930, 31, 32 was a disaster. And uh, 2000 was a pretty rough time, too. But those are real anomalies. By and large, the market tends to go up. So the problem with investing the way I'm describing is it's boring. And people tend to want to make bets, particularly now. So you got a phone. And you're sitting here with your phone. And the problem today is you have a phone in one hand. You're in a bar with your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband. you got... FanDuel on one phone, and you got Schwab on the other phone. And you're betting on the Eagles game or the Giants game on your one phone, and you're betting on Apple on the other one. And a lot of people don't think there's a difference. It's the same thing. You're just making a bet, right? But it's not. The stock market is not a casino. The stock market is the opposite of a casino. Whoever says that does nothing about the stock market. A stock in a casino, if you keep betting, you are statistically designed to lose. That's why it's a casino. The house has the advantage. In the stock market, if you keep investing, you are statistically designed to win. It's the opposite of a stock market. This is why I try to keep pounding this away on people who say, oh, I'm going to time it. I'm going to decide this week I'm going to sell my stocks and then next week I'm going to go back in. And you think you know when those best days are going to come? I assure you. You don't know. So stick with the long term. Now, Bogle knew this. Bogle said, people get bored. So what do you do with this? Here's what you do. You take 10% of your money and you go ahead and you bet it any way you want. You think you're a genius? You think you're a great stock market investor? Go ahead. Take your 10%, but keep the 90% away in an index fund. And you take the 10%. You bet on Apple, Microsoft, whatever the hell you want to bet in. But if you are honest about how you're evaluating your gains, You'll find over time, you are not going to be out. That 10% is not going to outperform the money you have in index funds if you do it over long periods of time. So there's my advice to everybody. Take the 10%. You think you're a genius? Go ahead. Invest where you want. Absolutely well said. Thank you so much, Bob. I know you have uh, places to be and things to do. Uh, so I would highly recommend our listeners check out Shut Up and Keep Talking. And I do appreciate your generosity today and all that you do for individual investors. Sammy, thank you very much for having me. A pleasure. Thank you very much, Bob. How to Build Your Next Million, Heritage Financial's ebook, teaches investors about the tools and strategies that can help them save, keep, grow, and protect their assets. This free ebook can be accessed in this episode's show notes and on our website at heritagefinancial.net. Thank you for listening to Wealthy Behavior. If you found the conversation useful, please leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts and share this episode so those around you can live a rich life too. We appreciate your feedback and questions. Please email us at wealthybehavior@heritagefinancial.net. For more insights, subscribe to our weekly blog at heritagefinancial.net and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Check out my personal finance blog at thebostonadvisor.com. Wealthy Behavior is produced by Kristen Kastner and Michelle Kakinis. This educational podcast is brought to you by Heritage Financial Services, LLC, located in the greater Boston area. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast or that of the speaker are subject to change and do not constitute investment advice or a recommendation regarding any specific product or security. There is no guarantee that any investment or strategy discussed will be successful or will achieve any particular level of results. Investing involves risks, including the potential loss of principal.